everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to both Julia Khan and also to this uh, this party tonight. Um, since everybody's been standing for a while, uh, I want to encourage people whose feet are hurting, you know, feel free to sit down and maybe people can stand. If they feel like prefer standing, stay, stay on the sides. Because, um, you know, we're going to talk for a little while. We'll try to keep it short, but we don't want everyone just being you know, upset and tired on their feet. Start, um, I'd like to make a small announcement relating to the awards that we just gave out. It seems that not everybody knows that the awards came with a monetary prize. Even the award winners themselves apparently <laughs> didn't have the money. So there is a prize for each winner. Uh, it's a thousand dollars each. It's dollars. It's not pounds. It's not Bitcoin. It's dollars. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, and again, so this, you know, congratulations to the winners again. So we felt that on this momentous day, a little bit of history was in order. And so uh, each of us are going to yeah. tell a little bit of the stories uh, from our own perspectives. And um, I thought I'd just start out by saying that um, our version of, 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 of Julius, you know, the, our version of we started in a garage, we didn't, is it, it, it involves a, a frisbee court in the West Coast over in Santa Barbara where uh, uh, Viral and Stefan used to play, and um, a car ride that never happened on the East Coast. Um, I had my old Honda Civic, and, and Jeff and I were going to go somewhere. I don't even know where we were going. Maybe Jeff remembers, but the car never went into drive. Instead, Jeff talked to me about what he wanted to do with his life. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the conversation went on for a while. And as far as I'm concerned, it was the best trip I've ever taken in a lifetime without even going into drive. <laughs> so, when I think about when we started all this, uh, it, 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 it was very clear to me that, that um, for an academic, you know, I, I part-time as a professor, I guess, that's my day job. For an academic, software is, 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 has been perceived as the kiss of death, or at least it seemed that way uh, back when we started, nine years ago. Uh, but uh, I'm happy to say that the times have changed, it's now 2018, and software it seems to be ter you know, very, very well respected in academics. Um, I'm thinking of, of um, any number of people who've gotten jobs because of their software or awards. Um, I think of Fernando Perez, who, who um, now has tenure at Berkeley, and um, I think it's because of the JU in Jupiter. I think that's what got him to do. So, uh, software is appreciated now. You're allowed to do it these days. Um, and, um, you know, and, I, and, and I'm kind of sort of appreciative because uh, I love the fact that the best minds on the planet are working on software now and, and, and what it's become. All of you here in this room <coughs> and everybody in the Julia community represents, to me, the, 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 the best and, and it's great. So, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I learned a lot um, through the, the, this world of Julia. A lot of things I didn't know about programming. I thought I knew a lot, but I, I found out how little I know. Um, I learn every day from the, the Julia community. One thing that, that I really grew to appreciate, and I'm still trying to figure out how to, to tell this message to others, is, is, is this relationship between computer science and computational science. The, 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 you know, the, I, I still see people who learn you know, how to program one way and people learn how to program another way. And you know, Julia's been this wonderful marriage between the two. And so if any of you can tell me how to articulate what it is that we're doing right here with Julia and just to spread the word, I'm, I'm all ears. So a little bit more um, with history, if I may. Uh, I wanted to bring up just a couple of, of old uh, websites and whatnot. So uh, let's go over here. Uh, so this, this, this website was from a class that I taught in, believe it or not, 2011. So I can't believe how many years have gone by. Um, this, this is a course that started out being a parallel computing course. It's now been hijacked and it's become a Julia course. <laughs> and I had a lousy web design, but Stefan here actually approved my design immensely, and this was his design here. And, uh, it's just kind of fun to, maybe I'll just show you, at the end of the semester, the students present projects 
And uh, I think some of these projects are still unfinished, so there's some chances here to <laughs> keep working on some of these. Uh, here's one where, uh, where, back then, we didn't really have a graphical front end. There was no Jupyter at all. So um, one student back in December 2011 uh, created a graphical front end. Um, Parallel Sparse Koleski, believe it or not, was, was, was implemented by the student in 2011. Um, we had this really fun event, social coyoting, where, oh, let me just show you the example here. This was, this was one of the most fun memories I have, where you could see, um, you know, uh, Jeff types one thing, you know, you get a variable, and then Bob types something else. You know, and then, and, and we actually did this in the room where um, everyone opened up their laptops and phones and started playing, and it became a big, big party. Um, and, you know, this is a very fun way to, to code, and I think there's still chances for that. Yeah, I was just trying to see that. Oh, yes, there we go. Zero, 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 three, Yeah, that this, this was a couple of days ago. That, yeah, look at that. Zero, zero, zero. You have to wonder why we put the original number in there at all. <laughs> make that even bigger. <laughs> Let's see what else we have here. Um, distributed sparse matrices. Uh, then, let me sort of switch over a little bit to my colleague, Stephen Johnson. Um, who this also has 0, 0.0.0, who is explaining um, how the FFT was implemented in Julia. And I have another thing that's on YouTube, and I'll just blow this up as well. Oh, does that not work? Um, but where, uh, let me make this full screen if I may. Is that, that didn't do anything. This is the one I need. Yeah, so, uh, so many of you know Stephen Johnson. I don't know anybody in the world who says that a language is doomed and then goes on to make so many contributions. <laughs> His song changed, though. He started out saying, you're doomed. I mean, every time he saw a girl, he'd say, you're doomed. He'd walk into my office. His office is right next to mine. You're doomed. Then later on, he kind of, you know, probably doomed, still might be doomed. I just tried to email him this morning to see if he's kind of lightened it up a little bit more, you know, the, where we are, uh, but I haven't gotten a response just yet. <laughs> so, so uh, lastly, this is, there's one last thing I want to do. Let's see if I can, oops, I think I have to do it this way. Uh, I attempted, this was 20 minutes ago, so it probably wasn't a good idea, but we'll see. Um, I wrote a little Julia code that represents sort of how I think programs have interacted in my lifetime. So, for example, here's a graph with 50 isolated nodes where no, 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 no program seems to work with another. Okay? And then, um, this is like a percolation model, you could have you know, edges. And you know, I started to see programs interacting with each other a little bit, so, you know, back in the early days, when, maybe when I, I was a graduate student. And then I learned about libraries. So, for example, um, I could put a library in node 5, and now you see um, everybody at least interacts with the library. Or I could put another library in node 20, See, and now everybody is interacting with these two nodes, but still things are isolated. And the wonderful thing about Julia is I've seen this sort of percolation keep continuing, where everybody keeps on interacting, and I just think that's wonderful. did a little bit of digging into heretofore unpublished email archives <laughs> related to the history of the project. This required some very careful editing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, I'm so there's a, a later part that involves a demo where S, uh, Jeff is going to SSH into his little machine that's down here because it's the only one that can run a really early version of Julia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to do a little bit of ancient history here. Um, and this is this is going back. This is actually the very first email. Uh, 
on which it was uh, for all Jeff and myself. Uh, and you can see that the subject line was already Julia, which how did we pick a name already? That seems impossible. <laughs> Uh, this project was genuinely born with the name Julia. It was because Jeff had a previous project that was called Julia. He had, he had done it you know, several years prior and abandoned it because you know, it was just him doing it. That didn't seem much fun. Um, but Varal was impressed with it and thought it was interesting. And I was talking to Varal in that, you know, while tossing a frisbee around and complaining about how we could do better in numerical computing. Um, and he said, you gotta, you got to talk to this guy, Jeff. Like he's got really interesting ideas. We need to we need to get put together. And this was the intro email. Um, so you know, this is this is what he asked, and uh, this turned out to be one of the first of <laughs> two, twenty thousand nine hundred sixty one emails we exchanged just between us. Um, I thought um, these are before any of the you know public archives start. So, so yeah. these are from the private yeah, archives. And that, that number was determined by a very rigorous methodology. <laughs> Google might be lying to us. You know? um, yeah, so my response was, uh, I was going to rant a bit, but you know, my basic take was that uh, you know, scientific computing, you know, I was tired. I, I, I have a bunch of slides that some people have probably seen where I talk about a Rube Goldberg machine that I made with like five or six different languages, and you know, this is what I was complaining about back then. So that was genuinely my motivation. Now you've seen a timestamped version of this. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Jeff, Jeff, I think very clearly uh, indicated exactly what he wants, right? You know? Um, and, uh, yeah. So well, this, is, this is my favorite bit in the whole thing, where they're all decides that on the balance, yes, I think multiple dispatch might be good to have. <laughs> It's, it seems convenient. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm going to take a moment here. I just realized I'm in the wrong slideshow. <laughs> um, but so, so far, they're identical, so you haven't really uh, you haven't lost anything. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so... Uh, you know, Jeff, Jeff was very keen on this. Uh, a little bit later on, we, uh, we, talk, we, we got into this. So uh, J this was actually the first mention of multiple dispatch. It wasn't multiple dispatch. It was actually single dispatch, which Jeff said he did not want. And the reason is you can see that, you know, people in uh, classic O languages would be horrified that we didn't want this, but you don't want to add to three. That was the objection. Um, <laughs> I was I was a bit skeptical. I said I feel that multiple dispatch is overkill. Uh, <laughs> come to regret that sentiment. Uh, <laughs> uh, but 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 in arithmetic and mathematics, it seems like a great idea because single dispatch is terrible. It fails miserably. Um, so I think I'm all for multiple dispatch in Julia. Are you are you still for it? <laughs> I, I I've come around. I've come around. <laughs> uh, I mean, I will say, I came around in literally one paragraph. <laughs> uh, Viral, Viral kept it simple and just said, yes, I think multiple dispatch would be good to have. Uh, classic Viral. Uh, you can see that even, even in this very, very early thread, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, the seeds of what we, what we wanted to do. Um, you know, Jeff wrote, what if we allowed inheritance of all types, but methods are compiled with the same, same signature with respect to built-in types? Um, sounds very familiar. Of course, this also sounds very familiar. The only overhead is lots of extra compilation, so. Nah, that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna be a problem. Yeah. So then, some time passes, uh, you know, we, we hacked. We, we did a lot of programming. Uh, we put up a Git repository. Uh, I convinced them to use Git kicking and screaming. Turned out to be the right move, but no one was happy about it at the time. Um, and then, this is April 1st, so April Fool's Day. Uh, we, don't really, we, couldn't, we couldn't figure out what exactly was going on here, but I think it must have been a lot of commits in one day or something. I don't know what this was about. Uh, but I also, you know, you know I, I love that it's on April 1st, <laughs> so, so it, he might not have meant it. I think I meant it, I think I meant it. 
there. Uh, <laughs> that's my only fancy transition. I couldn't resist. Uh, so what was he up to? And that is the question, and that's what we're going to see with this demo. All right, so. All right, there you go. You've got the podium. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So we have actually a, a really large amount of stuff in our Git history. Actually, the entire project still has all of its, its Git history. Uh, so that you can, you can go back and find a lot of really interesting things. Uh, and so where I am now is about uh, February 2010. Uh, oh. Well, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what's going on. Okay, so I, here I am in February 2010. I'm just curious, has anyone, how many people have ever, out of curiosity, gone, like checked out a super, super old commit in our, in our Git history, like in 2010 or 2009 or anything? How many people have done that? Only, only a pretty small number. Okay, well you can, if you want to replicate this experiment, you can do this. Uh, you can do this yourself at home. Um, so, so back then, uh, this, this was the entire repository. Uh, it was a couple of, back then the, the ext file extension was .j, just picked uh, as, uh, out of the air, and there were a lot of scheme source files and a couple of .j files, and, and that was it. Uh, at this stage, the entire project was just an interpreter written in Scheme, and I was using Gambit C Scheme system. Um, we can see, so at, at this point, there are, uh, oops. <laughs> so there's about 3,800 lines of Scheme, and at this point, there are exactly 999 <laughs> lines of Julia code uh, in, in the world. Uh, and we, uh, so there, there's an interpreter, Julia interpreter, and this has a, a lot of stuff that is, you know, it's not easy, it's not light reading, but uh, it has a lot of stuff that you'd find familiar, like a, a lot of little names that, that you'll see. Uh, there's, there's an implementation of subtyping in there, uh, which we certainly hadn't figured out, and in fact uh, didn't figure out until, until very recently. I mean, uh, Fran Franco is here. Where, where's Franco? Yeah, he, he eventually figured it out. <laughs> but, this is, but this was this was the really rough cut, um, and, and yeah, it goes on, it goes on. But the, the real the real the real point is so this is the down here. This is the that's the entire REPL implementation. There's the Julia prompt. That's the, that's the whole REPL, and the the banner is there. <laughs> We have, we have the banner. And then there, there's a little script in here. So if you do this, um, I, had, I found I had to make one small change to get this to actually run. And uh, I can, if you want that patch, I can send it to you, or maybe we should put it in 1.0. <laughs> we might need that. Uh, so, and, and there's a little shell script that just starts the Gambit scheme interpreter with loading all of the files you need to run it. And then when, the, when these files load, they then load all, all the Julia code that, that we had in our, in our you know, library, so to speak. And now, so I'm going to run this. And or can, I, can everyone see this? Well, actually, if I do, uh, I can move it up to the top, right? Yeah. I should do that, yeah. All right. And now, I want, I'm going to run this. I want every, everyone watch very, very carefully. Or watch very carefully. The, the poor startup time was there from the beginning. <laughs> It takes about three to four seconds 
to load those 999. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure why. <laughs> But that's that's not that's not a good rate. <laughs> uh, and you you can you can kind of use this. I can do one plus three and get four. But then this, frankly, this this gets ugly really quickly. What 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 if I try to do that? Unhandled tree type H cat. What about what about that? Unhandled tree type V cat. Uh, it, it's really hard to use this thing. It is really hard to get things done. I, I had to go through the code to figure out how do I make an array. I couldn't, I guess I just couldn't do it. And it turns out we had a function called vector, where you can just give it some some arc, some values, and it makes a it makes a vector out of them with that beautiful printing. And then interestingly, it does support arrows because it's, uh, it's it has it has read line binding. But uh, and now if I try to maybe add one to it, no method. And look, this, this, this is my favorite part, actually. Look at, look at how the, the error is printed for types array and then in 32. And there's, there's no separator at all. It just, prints, it just prints the types of the arguments one after the other without, without even any, I mean, it's pretty amazing. In 32, in 32, float 64. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't even fling you a comma or a space. I mean, this is bad. I don't, I don't know how we even wrote 999 lines. I, I have no idea how we did that. Uh, there is a random number generator, actually, which is kind of neat, and you can make random matrices. Random matrices had to be there very early because, because Alan. <laughs> and, and you, we did have matrix add, and this is another time to watch pretty carefully. If I, if I add two random 10 by 10 matrices, <laughs> look at look at how long that takes, and and it takes it takes that long every single time. <laughs> so now it only takes that long the first time. <laughs> so that's a huge improvement. And that, that's because it is, you know, the, the whole thing is running in an interpreter, and it is running ev every single step of subtyping and in the, in the minutest detail in an interpreter written in Scheme, running in a Scheme interpreter for every little tiny step. So it is just, you know, in, insanely inefficient in, in every way. Uh, but that's, you know, that, that's what makes it fun. <laughs> and then you have to, so when you, when you exit out of this, you're now, you're now you get back to a, a Gambit prompt, I think. Yeah, so now you exit back to the Scheme prompt, and then, and then you can exit out. Uh, we have the random number generator is really good. This is one of my favorite parts of, of the code base. That's that's the random one. Is Raphael? What do you think? <laughs> it's it's simple. It's good. So this this is this is a function that you give it a seed and it returns a closure that gives you a, a random number generator with uh, with uh, with starting at that seed. Sort of in true in true scheme SICP fashion. So this is what we were using. That's the that's the whole code. Uh, we actually had a, a rational type. What I, what I was impressed me a lot is that when we called it struct at first, so we were, we were right the first time. We were right the first time. Uh, type parameters use square brackets. Uh, to to make an instance, you had to do this really annoying thing where you had to say the type and then dot new because we still weren't clear on the whole multiple dispatch thing. Okay. So there we, we had, there were still some dots, you know. And other than that, some of this looks surprisingly similar. Uh, so so let's see. I think you know you can you can I encourage you to uh, to to check this out. You just need to install uh, Gambit C. Uh, you can try this yourself if you'd like. <laughs> All right, I think, I, I think that's it. Yeah, good, proceed. <laughs> uh, it's got considerably less dependencies than Julia does now, so it should be easy to install. <laughs> find the right version of this talk that I'm actually in the middle of. There we go. All right. So now we now we know what Jeff was up to.
Sorry, I didn't mean to show that again. That's pretty awesome. Um, so then there, I, I think the next really, really big milestone in the project was uh, the blog post. Um, and you can see that's the subject line of this email thread. Uh, and Veral said uh, he posted the, the, the blog post on Reddit, uh, which we were very happy about. Um, <laughs> if you can't read this, it says, um, perhaps telling everyone else first would have been in order. <laughs> me. I was on, in vacation in, uh, in Argentina, and I woke up to Reddit blowing up. And I was like, what? I, I wasn't done editing that. Yet. <laughs> Jeff said, yes, it seems this should have been up to the author to post. Were we even finished editing? <laughs> so, but this, this, is, this is a theme, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a theme, and I've come to appreciate it a lot. Veral pushes you in the pool before you're ready to get in. <laughs> and it is usually a good idea. My defense, when I when I actually published it, there was a comment on the blog already, and it was live on the internet. Uh, yeah, this but, thread goes on to, to be like, oh, but it was public already, and I was like, no, that was my that was my girlfriend's brother. <laughs> 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 so not quite public, but yes. And, and uh, it was it was mere minutes after this that we met many of you, which which made it all okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, so on to some modern history. Uh, so this is, you know, that was the prehistory of Julia. Um, this is this is sort of things that people will actually remember. Uh, so you know, February 2012 is when we published that blog post, and that was, you know, there wasn't an official version, but you saw it in the banner there. It was 0.0.0. pre-release. Still don't know why we had a version number at all at that point, but you know, we did. Um, and what did we have? At that point, you know, we had developed an LLVM code generator, so it wasn't this interpreters inside of interpreters business anymore. Um, and it was actually fast, you know, it was not, you know, the reason people were interested is because it actually, it actually lived up to the performance claims that we had in that blog post. Um, we had C call, which is pretty key. You can call C libraries really, really easily. I think a lot of languages have actually copied our design in that, and it's, you know, it's been very successful. Um, we could save system images, so that was that was the answer to that horrible startup time. So the got, startup time got a lot worse from that point, actually. <laughs> we kept adding code and it kept getting much worse, and we knew that was a problem. And now, fortunately now, that's been completely solved. Right? <laughs> it's pretty good right now. Uh, no, it, it, I, as I recall, it got up to like 30 seconds to start the rebel. It was, it was very bad. It was really bad. So we knew, you know, you can't announce a thing like that. You have to fix it somehow. So, uh, Jeff, I'm sure it was you, you implemented the system image saving. Um, and that, that got the startup town time down to like, you know, a second or something like that. Uh, remote call, so we were already doing distributed computing. Um, you know, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure we didn't nail it entirely on the first try, but it worked pretty well. And, you know, you get remarkably far with being able to serialize almost any object and send it over a socket and then deserialize it and have it, you know, reconstituted. <laughs> Um, a manual. This is a very important feature, but if you have not documented your language, yeah. no one's going to use it. Uh, I spent a couple of months of evenings uh, writing this manual before we, we announced the language, and I think, you know, had, had I not done that, we probably would have gotten nowhere with that blog post, because people would have been like, sounds great, how do I do anything? Um, Ken showed up very early on, uh, and uh, I think he had a very reasonable position here. He said, you should maybe test some stuff and maybe have CI. Um, and his uh, you know, early, early interest in bi automated binary package building is showing here. Um, and, and actually we see here, especially once we support Windows builds for master, I love that he is already a weed at this point. <laughs> that is a turning point with every person who comes to the project. They're the they first, and then and then they become we. And that's really like that's when things begin. That's when we really get somewhere. Is when we are we. Um, and he set out on a pretty epic expedition to port Julia to Windows. No big deal. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, it, it turned out like that you know later we had no we had no idea how young he was, but you know it's amazing that someone so young can accomplish so much. Um, he he and Jameson teamed up and became a two-headed monster that conquered Windows and Libby. Yeah, pretty pretty much right after we first released this, it became the Keno and Jameson show very 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 quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I have to also add that um, after the port to Windows. Um, since we didn't have CI on Windows, Keno also ported Travis to Windows and was really upset that they didn't accept his patches. <laughs> as far as I know, they still don't support Windows, even though you did it for them. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are, these are some of the... We probably missed some big features in here, but these are some of the big features in each of the uh, you know, major, pro major releases of Julia. Um, so about a year after the blog, initial blog post, we, we published Julio 0.1. Uh, a pretty big feature was namespaces and modules. We got a lot of grief about not having any sort of namespace system after pub like publishing this post about this language. And people were like, you have no namespaces? We do not. No, sorry. So those had to be implemented. And I, I looked at it, and I think it actually it, it was done very quickly. It, it, they, they were there after something like a month or two. But that you know that one month without it you know really well you've got damage. a lot of grief in that month did a lot of damage yeah <laughs> yeah um, and then the Libya V port which you know was was a huge deal that took eleven months I think that is the longest a, a, a fork of the language has existed and the the approach was to just replace all of the I/O stuff which was a an I/O support library that Jeff had written. Um, with LibUV, which is a portable I/O library, that was an epic, epic project. Um, and you know, I, I don't know where we'd be without that work having been done by them. Um, that was Keno and Jameson. Um, I wrote a package manager, um, largely, largely because yeah, I didn't know I would be still doing that. <laughs> if, I, if I had, I might have just not done it. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but the reason, the reason I wrote a package manager, if you go back in the history here, we had just packages in the contrib directory in the Julia repo. That was just our package manager. It's like, oh, install this thing, and oh yeah, there's like a, you know, a text editor and a web browser and like a, you know, a random matrix library and just like weird, weird, crazy stuff was just in the Julia repo for a while. Um, and that, that seemed like a bad way to do things, so I wrote the package manager. Um, and then C function, which was implemented by Jameson as well, um, and that has been wildly successful. It, it uh, lets you very easily call back into Julia from, from C libraries, which is a, an incredibly useful piece of functionality. You were saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so then November 2013, this was a pretty short release. Uh, cycle. Julia 0.2. This had some pretty big stuff. Immutable struct types. I don't know how we lived without them, but they were amazing and they, they really, you know, may have made the language a lot of what it is today. Keyword arguments, those are pretty important. Um, optional arguments, too. Um, and then a profiler. And keyword arguments were implemented by Mike Nolta, who um, was a really, really uh, prolific contributor early on, and I think he's been, you know, dragged back into like IDL and Python maybe because he's an astronomer. But we miss him, and we would love to have him back. Um, and Tim Holy wrote the profiler. He wrote two profilers actually. Um, he wrote an instrumenting. Yeah, So he, he wrote an instrumenting profiler and a, uh, a sampling profiler and found that the instrumenting profiler did too much, changed the, changed the behavior sucked. of the program too much. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a known thing about instrumenting profilers. If you put enough instrumentation in your program to get profiles, then you've changed your program. Um, and a, a sampling profiler doesn't have that problem as much. Um, okay, so August 2014, we're on a good roll with like nine month releases here, uh, 0 0.3. Uh, this was actually a pretty, this is sort of like, you know, Snow Leopard or whatever, when Apple decides to just do like a, we're not going to do a ton of features, but we're just going to like clean things up and tighten them up release. Uh, 
one of the big cleaning items was our REPL had, we had, we've always had a pretty nice REPL. I mean, you saw how nice that REPL was when <laughs> Jeff was using it. It was actually pretty good for what the rest of the programming language was. Um, but you know, we, we, we had a nice REPL, um, but it was this hacked, hacked, like horrible read line thing, which started out reasonable and got to the point where we were hooked into almost every single character you could push was hooked somehow. Um, so he just, you know, rewrote it, and uh, we have, you know, had since then a native Julia REPL. Um, and it turns out that if you don't try to support hardware that hasn't existed since 1978, it's actually really easy to write a terminal library. <laughs> um, uh, Value-based numerical hashing. This is kind of weird. Like if you, if you know, it seems straightforward, but it was very. We didn't really know what to do uh, about the fact that, you know. If you're trying to hash a floating point number and an integer and they're equal to each other, how do you make those actually agree? Uh, and I came up with some clever ideas there and managed to make that work. It's still some of the hairiest, weirdest part of the code, but it works. Um, uh, and then quality, stability, and longevity. This was one of the longest, most heavily supported releases. I think there were 11 point releases of point three. There's still a lot of places that are still using point three. Um, it's a very, very solid release, and a lot of that was due to Tony Kelman. He came in and... Anyone here still on point three? <laughs> yeah. I still have code on it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, Tony has an, an incredible eye and, and doggedness about the quality and reliability of the code you write. And it, it, it had a huge impact on the project at a critical time. Uh, 0.4. So this was, you know, we're getting in closer to, uh, you know, recent history that people actually remember. Uh, tuples with struct layout, which is a handy thing if you're interacting with C code. Two um, tuples before that were done in a way that was a failed experiment. <laughs> <laughs> um, generated functions. This was actually a, uh, it was uh, Keno and Tim Holy, and they just sort of hacked the first version out at JuliaCon at the, at the, at the, the, the hack day that afterwards. Was the, the, at the first JuliaCon, I believe. For, was first, the first ever JuliaCon. Yeah, that's right. It was in Chicago, so. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. You know, in the day they had a pretty a pretty functional working version of generated functions, um, and that's been a very powerful and uniquely Julian feature. Um, documentation system. This was huge. Uh, that was Michael Hatherley. Um, and, and Moro Verder, he prototyped it. Oh, that's right. Moro Verder did prototype it. I had forgotten about that. I would have put his name if I remembered. Um, yeah, I mean, this is huge to have. A, a, this is the you know, you can write strings in line in Julia and attach them to objects. Like, you know, people have been talking about this. It's a great idea. Someone needed to implement it, and those guys did. And it was, it, it you know, been transformative. Uh, Precompiled modules. This was Jameson. Um, it's, I mean, it's changed everything because before this, you know, the load times for packages were really, really un unbelievably bad, uh, and precompiled modules were a real <laughs> respite. Um, of course, we've managed to get compile time to the point where we're starting to need more more things to solve this problem, but like it's served us extremely well for a long time. So now we just need to pre-compile and save more stuff. Um, and then we got a generational GC. Before this, we had a very simple mark and sweep. Worked fine, but it wasn't particularly high performance. And uh, uh, Chow and Oscar just did amazing work on this. And both of them just kind of came out of nowhere. They're these like brilliant hackers who just showed up and were like, Here's a generational GC. And you're like, awesome. <laughs> Who are you? Uh, I, and also, I think Yichao just sort of does this as a hobby, man, roughly. But he is probably as good as like most professional GC implementers, which he seems to have learned in like a couple of weeks. He's like, oh, I got that. Oh, like, apparently, he's actually a physicist. Yeah, he's a physicist. Who knew? Um, <laughs> uh, he's at Harvard. He's not here. Yeah. Um, Zero point five. That was a that was a that was a long drawn out release process, but it 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 had some really amazing things in it. Um, so the great function overhaul, which I I feel like I I've sort of left off names where it's just like the same names over and over again. Like, but Jeff did this one, and it's one of the finest pieces of work he's ever done. The great function overhaul is like 
one of the things that makes modern Julia what it is. The fact that you can, you know, just use higher order programming and there's zero, zero cost to it is amazing. And, yeah. Uh, generator expressions were sort of like a, a tossed off side effect. They were just sort of like, yeah, sure, we could have those as well. They were part of the sort of a side of, nice side effect of the gener the function overall. Uh, Steve Johnson came up with and then implemented this fused broadcasting syntax, which I think I was a bit iffy about at first. I wasn't sure how I felt about it, but I think we can all agree that it's been a really, really wildly successful experiment. Um, and I've even come to like quite like the syntax. 85% um, test coverage. So Katie, Katie got a prize earlier today. Um, yeah. it is, uh, well deserved. She nearly and, and Tony did a fair bit of work here as well um, on making sure the test coverage was high. But Katie was just a, a machine. I mean, she just goes in and like tests one thing after another after another. Um, Katie is also a physicist. Also a physicist. Uh, I think what we're, one of the things we've learned in the process of this is that there are a lot of people who, like, day job is being a scientist who are amazing programmers. Um, I think arguably the best programmers. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm only a programmer, but everyone else in here apparently is a scientist and a programmer. <laughs> um, then 0 0.6, you know, this is very recent memory, but, uh, but you know, Remember life before 265 two, was solved? Like, I barely do. I'm like, oh, that was terrible. Why? Uh, that took a long time to fix. That was, of course, Jameson. Triangular dispatch, which is actually, actually sort of just a symptom of a massive overhaul of subtyping in general. Um, and the type system, which was Jeff again. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time deleting weird string types. Um, I had put them in there in the first place, so it was my job to get rid of them. D deleting uh, things is the highest form of, of software development. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, do, I, I do think that you know, there's, a, there's a place for supporting all sorts of different string types, but I do think that the core library needs to be opinionated about what, what it considers a string to be and what it does, just for lack of confusion. Um, and of course, we took vector transposes very, very seriously. <laughs> this is one of the longest threads on the Julia GitHub repo and possibly anywhere on GitHub. Certainly on this type of subject, I feel like any other, any other project, you, if you found this, you'd be like, what are these people doing? Um, this was a very deep, hard problem. Jihau did a huge amount of work on this. He was initially instigated by Alan, um, and you know, Alan pretty much sock puppeted him to write this, write this uh, issue, but then man, man, did that turn into a crazy, crazy ride. And then Andy Ferris was the one who finally, in the end, was like, all right, enough talking, people. Let's do something. <laughs> Implemented it, and it was amazing. We we weren't sure. <laughs> Again, it's one of these things. We we practice very experimental pro programming language design, where you know you're like, well, I don't know. Let's try it and see how it goes. If it's horrible, we'll change it. Um, like the struct name, you know, clearly we, <laughs> we went around in circles on that one. Uh, no, we took, we took vector transposes very ser seriously and I think uh, it shows. So the present, now we are actually to today. Um, this gets multiple slides because there are so many features in this release. Uh, so Julia 1.0, package 3, so I talked about that earlier today. Uh, it's a pretty good package manager. Uh, <laughs> It is, it is. Uh, the new you iteration it, protocol. Can say it. The new package manager is awesome. We have a new iteration protocol, which, uh, you know, I, it's, it's interesting because it's very hard to get that excited about an iteration protocol. <laughs> um, but, but when you tell people, like, remember that time you tried, you had a generator or like, some sort of generator expression and it was empty and you got an error and you were like, why can't you, can I do that? 
this is why this solves that problem. So I think if no, for no other reason, that weird corner case where you're like, why can't I just iterate over no things? Um, the new iteration protocol totally solves that. It required a bunch of work. Um, a huge, uh, this was done by Keno, I mean, both of these things. The new optimizer is amazing. I think a lot of the huge performance improvements that we've seen in 1.0 when people have been playing with it are due to this. I mean, this thing is, is very clever. Uh, and name tuples, so uh, this, is, this is a nice feature. Um, it's great for data analysis because you can, you can treat a row of data much the way you would sort of treat, you know, you want to access things by name, you don't really care what position they're in, and you want that to be efficient and convenient, and then now it is. Uh, and then strings can hold arbitrary data, so I think that's important for data analysis as well. Um, all right. And finally, uh, fast keyword arguments. So now we can actually use keyword arguments. We've had them for a long time, but they used to be slow. So that's kind of, you know, it's like, great, you have a feature, but it's, you know, it's a no-no to use it. So that's not really, not really ideal. Uh, the find and search APIs, Milan did amazing work here. Um, tirelessly, like, iterated over this and, you know, got a lot of, like, into a lot of heated debates with Jeff about how this should look and somehow managed to weather that process. Um, and, and then implement all of it. And it, it looks really nice. It's very nice. Um, uh, fast unions and arrays, this is why we had you sit down, by the way, this is going on a little longer than intended. But <laughs> we've, there's been a lot of features. Um, so the, this is how we, we support nothing and the new, no, new nothing and missing stuff. Um, <laughs> Fast unions of, and, and arrays of unions of things. And so this is, a, a, it's interesting. I proposed a much more limited version of this a couple of years ago, and nobody liked it. Um, because it was this like weird thing that just special case nothing. Because I was like, well, we need a solution to this problem. But you know, it turns out that the general version of that, where you don't special case nothing, and you're like, oh, well, if you just have a small number of unions of small things, then that's totally fine. That appealed to the compiler types, whereas the like, yeah, why is nothing special? That that did not fly at all. Um, so this was amazing work by Jacob, Jameson, and Milan. And now now we have the first class, like some of the best nothing and missing data support. <laughs> I perpetrated this one, taking matrix transposes seriously. I did nothing to solve the problem. Um, Andreas Jihau, Andy Ferris again, um, and, and a lot of other people had input on this linear algebra stuff, um, and, and it, it turned out pretty nicely. I think we, we now take all of the linear algebra types very seriously. <laughs> next year. Yeah, that's the next issue. <laughs> so the future. Um, what can we do with all this power? And we're all going to say a few words about where we're going with this. Um, so, well, first of all, I don't wish to be the person that is standing between dessert and uh, you guys. So I'm going to try and make this quick. Uh, but before I, I say a few words on this topic uh, about where I I, I think that uh, where, where we think all of this is going to go, I, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we named a few people, we named a few features out here, and it was very hard to put something in this compact form. Um, there are many people here whose names uh, are not on the slide. That does not mean that, you know, your recognitions are not, uh, your, your, your contributions are not recognized. Um, I, I think that there needs to be sort of a list of all the packages uh, that came up with every version of Julia out there, and you know all the amazing stuff that has happened. So, uh, you know, the, uh, I apologize. We all apologize for all the names that we could not fit in here. Thank you. Thank you to everyone in this room and everyone who contributed. So we, we, we are almost at version 
1.0, it appears. Um, the question is, where do we go, right? And what I wanted to do was, you know, when, when, when we were thinking about, when we, when we were putting these things together, we were thinking about, is this going to be a list of compiler features, language features, parallelism? Um, where, what does the future look like? And we all thought that instead of maybe positioning this as a, a, a list of features, it should be uh, it, it should be something uh, you know bigger, and and what's amazing about Julia has always been the people uh, and all of you guys. As Jeff pointed out, he's the only programmer here. Everyone <laughs> here actually does something else, um, and and we've all had the the fortune of of interacting with all of you guys and solving some of the most amazing problems, learning so much, and uh, you know let, I I think this is a good slide that that shows oops. <laughs> I can never understand how these uh, transitions work. All right. So, so if you look at it on on your left hand side, uh, these are some of the things that that all of us know about Julia. You know, uh, multiple dispatch we've had it since day one. Generic programming, code specialization. We've got native code. We've got all the parallelism. We need more of it. That's great. That's that's what Julia. That's what Julia can do. That's what all of us are very uh, familiar with. Um, but if you look at the right hand side, that's that's what really matters at the end of the day. And uh, these are some of these are five of the fourteen problems that I found in the engineering grand challenges. And I just I just thought I'd put them up here. But these are the problems. This is why we really started Julia, right? What? Why did we want such an amazing programming language? Uh, not just for the sake of itself, but so that we could have a real impact on the world around us. And uh, what I want to do is uh, maybe you know dive into uh, uh, some of these uh, a little bit further. And what what takes us from the left hand side to the right hand side here? So this was one of the the most uh, amazing uh, things that that uh, again you know Keno's name just keeps coming up over and over and over again. I don't know how how one person can do so much. But, but this was a pro project with uh, Kero, uh, with um, Kiran Pamnani, uh, you know, many of the folks, Jeff Razier, I, I can't even name everyone, I can't remember them. Um, <laughs> there's, this was a very large project. There are like 12 co-authors. There's, there's, this is a huge paper with multiple co-authors. Um, 650,000 cores, right? Um, we, we know the numbers. 650,000 cores, 60 terabytes of data, 1.3 million threads, one point five petaflops per second on the world's fifth largest supercomputer right there. All in pure Julia. And this is what the stack looks like. We started with some hardware out there on the top, but then you know you add in some Julia magic. Uh, you got your multiple dispatch and generic programming. You add in a few packages. You add in a little bit of automatic differentiation, yes, Jared. Uh, I think uh, Jared deserves a, a huge applause for all his amazing work. <laughs> and, <laughs> the world's first complete astronomical catalog, right? So, so this was this is the kind of stuff. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I, I'm taking some scientific liberty here, so do not quote me uh, on that side. <laughs> Uh, but but really enabling the kind of scientific discovery that would otherwise not be possible. Um, the, the amount of data that this telescope generated over 15 years is, uh, you know, the next telescope is going to generate every three days. So it's going to be 60 terabytes every three days. So this is this is this is a huge challenge we're going to uh, face soon. And, and and this stack is is what I want to you know maybe draw attention to that while we start out up there you know with with all these carefully thought out abstractions. This really is a community, as Alan pointed out, of people all talking to each other, building amazing tools, and, and eventually sort of you know, moving from that left-hand side that we had to the right-hand side. And I'm going to try and you know, put some of these in context. Um, and this, I, I hope this points the way to the future. Um, here's another project uh, that, that uh, you know, Krishna Caucus, Simon Byrne have been heavily involved with, um, our <laughs> collaborators of the University of Maryland. Um, this is a slightly different stack. So the earlier one was Intel's Knights Landing. This one, uh, Chris, I, I know that this is not really on GPUs yet, but but the feature already runs on GPUs, and that's where we're heading. Some, uh, you know, some more of my scientific. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Again, the same story unfolds, some of the same packages, um, you know, more optimization. But at the end of this, what, what you get is personalized medicine. You, you start out with uh, GPUs and Julia, and you end up with personalized medicine. And this is going to, uh, if, if all goes well, you know, be part of a clinical trial uh, very soon, uh, where you're going to have a Julia program that's going to decide exactly how much uh, of a dose to, uh, you know, to give someone uh, in a hospital so that, uh, and it, it might sound like, what's the big deal, right? Medicines don't cost that much. It's, it's the hospital that costs a lot, right? Um, but the way it works out in the healthcare system is that, if the, if, if the person is not treated well enough and, and is sent home and comes back within 30 days, the hospital gets penalized and it hugely affects their rating and the profitability. And, and that cost is obviously passed on either to you or to the taxpayer um, um, in general. So, so personalized medicine that actually makes you better um, you know, and, and gets the job done is, is going to actually lead to much more affordable healthcare. And that should be the large goal that, that I think all of us in this room should you know, have the bigger picture for. Um, this is this is a buzzy topic. Um, you know, we, we all know about these neural nets. I think the interesting story here is that machine, right? Um, hundred petaflops on on that pod, uh, hundred petaflops per second. That's that's what is rated at. And uh, the GPU three is supposed to come out soon. What does this stack look like? Turns out, if you are a Julia programmer, this stack does not look very different. Um, just change the hardware on the top. You get all the multiple dispatch and genetic programming and all the good stuff. The same packages, um, you, get, uh, you get Flux and Knet, uh, another amazing set of packages. Uh, I think uh, both Mike and Denise uh, deserve a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Again, you know, we, we, we take these things, these, you know, put them in the optimization, automatic differentiation, calculate the derivatives, uh, you know, and, and and solve some amazing problems out here. And Julia is just beginning to do that. One of the, the you know, a, a huge amount of progress made by our Google Summer of Code uh, projects students this year. By the way, uh, the the Julia Summer, the Julia Google Summer of Code is following its own Moore's law. The number of GSOC students doubles every year, right? So uh, it, it's fantastic uh, to to have this support. And I, I think most of our GSOC students are here this year. Um, a big round of applause. For And uh, the number of GSOC students who come back and become, continue to be people who are in the community and contributors and then go on to run and like mentor people in GSOC is just astounding. And I, I don't know how other projects do, but it's, it's, it's really impressive. It's impressive. <laughs> Key people in the Julia community, like you know Mike Innes and Shashi, Shashi yeah. started out as GSOC students, and now they're you know they're running the Simon GSOC Danish. and Those Simon Danish. Yeah. Those were the and they, they you know they didn't they stuck around for the long haul, and it's yeah. it's great to have them. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, unbeknownst to many of you, Keno actually has a secret branch with Julia running on TPUs. And uh, <laughs> scientific uh, liberty here. Uh, he actually does. Um, was well, but the, the reason I point this is that while we have some experimental stuff now, this you know these are the directions that I think are interesting that that we all think we should maybe you know think hard about going for. Um, this is this is an application that I've been personally involved in, um, and Ranjan gave an amazing talk today. Um, this is a this is a uh, an, a completely different field, landscape ecology. This is this actually turns out to be a region from uh, from central India uh, for tiger conservation, um, and this is the problem that it's trying to avoid, which is uh, animals trying to cross uh, you know protected areas and being knocked over by cars. Um, this is what that stack looks like. This one runs on regular CPUs. It runs actually on desktops. Everything else I showed was sort of an exotic application. This is, this is probably more realistic for, I think, most of us out here. And, and, but this one, again, you know, you get Julia, sparse matrices, solvers. Um, the autodiff is not in here yet, but that's where the uncertainty analysis is headed here, and the sensitivity analysis. Apply not just for corridors, but climate change fire. And um, this, this application, not the Julia version, which was just uh, launched uh, last week, but, but the, uh, the original Python version 
um, actually stopped uh, the highway construction in India in that region for seven years. Um, millions of dollars of, of, of government funding uh, stopped in order to uh, protect wildlife. And that's a, real, uh, that's a real policy change where you have the scientific computing work that, that many of us do here and connect it to sort of something that's much bigger than just an academic paper and, and something that's much more relevant to the larger uh, community. So I think the theme here is, is in my mind, uh, you know, impact through composability and abstractions, and this is a theme that, that all, all of us have uh, spoken about. But if, if you have the right composability, if you have the right abstractions, then we are all going to be able to achieve great impact. And you know, while we, while we work and argue about issues and bugs every day, I think these are some of the things uh, we, should, we should probably aim for. Um, and with that, I think uh, it's, it's time for the, you know, in, 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 in uh, Steve Jobs' famous words, one more thing. Um, <laughs> we're gonna uh, invite Alex Ursland on stage. Yes, Alex please. is our release manager. Oh. Who has been <laughs> We haven't said what we're doing yet, but it clearly seems like everyone knows. <laughs> it involves a release manager. Just do the watch. So we get Autobot. <laughs> oh yeah, it's our end here. So we're gonna take a few seconds while, you know, some things are set up. I think this is a good uh, opportunity to mention that there's 130 people watching on the live stream, and it was up to 150 a little bit earlier, so. Thank you for being our live stream over here. He really does do everything. <laughs> I seem to have lost the display. I'm, I'm mirroring, but huh? Sorry. Oh, you switched it. Oh, oh we all, we'll tell you when we're ready. Sorry. This is so that he can enter credentials and that people watch it. That's <laughs> super secret. So, how many of you can actually uh, log into GitHub on your phones? All right. Uh, you know. Yeah, load up Julia, Larry, Julia. <laughs> yeah, any, anyone who has a, a laptop or a phone or anything that can do it, please uh, go to GitHub and find a relevant pull request. <laughs> <laughs> we are trying to get the maximum number of upvotes and reviews on this particular VR. Um, <laughs> All right, yeah, so it seems like people are doing this, so we, you know, that gives us a little more time. <laughs> I, I also want to mention enough. that for the past, uh, well, for the past about two days, especially, uh, we've all been working very hard on package compatibility with 07 and 1.0. Uh, we, we were up pretty late last night uh, with that goal in mind. And uh, like, Kenna, what are what are the current what are the current stats? How many packages do we have? Uh, when I checked last, at like 7 p.m., we had 185 passing packages on 1.0, up from 106 yesterday. So over the course of you know yesterday and today, 82 packages got tagged and fixed. Yeah. So we we fixed 80 packages in two days. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and 485 packages passing on 0.7. All right. Yay, point seven. You know what to do. Please, please find this PR and upvote. If you have access, please give an approved review. If you do approve, I'm not going to tell you what to think. <laughs> but I you, hope you approve. If you download it, we will name and shame you right now. <laughs> no, no, you can download it if you think. All right, so we will wait a couple of seconds here and see.
Can you scroll down to see the approvals? <laughs> All right, people, pick up the pace. We've got a language to release. It's, it's like fairies. If not enough people upvote, it won't happen. <laughs> All right, who's, who's still trying to, to uh, approve? <laughs> this is the ultimate in approval scene. Did we break GitHub? Oh yes, uh, uh, along with the release manager, we also have our chief emoji officer here. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think Frederick right. has approved like five times. <laughs> All right. I think we're doing it. I think, I think we're doing it. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, are we, are we going to try and get a drum roll, or that's not going to happen? Wait, another one. Yeah, drum roll. <laughs> 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 Yes, please, drum roll, please, please. Woo! Do it! Hit it. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Final thing, um, Sam, where are you? I think this this wonderful event would not have been possible without all the amazing, uh, you know, uh, all the amazing work done by Sam. So I think you deserve a huge round of applause. Sam, do you want to maybe? Uh, say what's uh, the plan for the rest of the evening and uh, you know thank you all very much again okay round of applause for everybody <laughs> we've come a long way thank you all very much thank you Okay, so uh, that was a little longer than we expected, so <laughs> catering is probably going to bring out some desserts now, I imagine quite quickly. Um, <laughs> the music will start playing, the bar is still open, have a drink, have some food, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone on the live stream. Say hi to the people at home.